Okay. Okay, here we are. Uh, today really is uh, one of the sort of mission impossible projects, one of these things where I sort of think at the beginning, well, how can I possibly do it? And when I first started approaching the, our topic today, I thought, well, I'll have to do at least part one and part two until I realized that really the truth is I'll have to do such a basic introduction that, uh, you know, I'll have to leave it to, to you to decide which aspects uh, you want to go farther into. Of course, I'm talking about, um, let me get it up here, classical Chinese ceramics. And I say there, uh, peak of human artifice. I think that uh, a couple of things, as I'm going to talk to you in the next slide, China is the heavyweight champion of decorated pottery, ceramics, fine porcelain, the inventors of porcelain. Again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, there's just nobody else. And much of the uh, ceramic tradition that you find in other places um, is something are all owe a great deal to the Chinese. The other thing is that there are so many different periods and each period, of course, uh, there are workshops. And so as with some of the ancient Greek uh, craters and other um, ceramics, you have workshops, you have individual artists. Of course, in Chinese history, everything is also always divided into dynasty. So today I'm just going to mention the very basic dynasties. Most people have heard of the Ming dynasty, but not coincidentally, because it is considered basically at least one of the finest dynasties. So for ceramics. So what I want to do today then is give you uh, a little bit about the very early history and the origins of uh, Chinese ceramics, and then just a taste of the various uh, dynasties and major schools of ceramics. There's so many other things we could do, but it really would be too long. And I and this is a video for people who really just want to see what classical Chinese ceramics is all about and sort of take the measure of the topic, which is vast. And there are lifetimes of study that you could devote to uh, the topic of Chinese ceramics. It is the oldest and biggest ceramics culture uh, by far, by miles. There's no competition. Um, you had, uh, as long ago as the sixth millennium BC, again, that's sort of, uh, that's old, that's old dynasty Egypt. That's early Egypt. Uh, that's, uh, the Sumerians, Mesopotamia. Of course, the Egypts, the Egyptians and Sumerians, Sumerians with the Tigris and the Euphrates, the Egyptians with the Nile also worked a lot in clay. We have a lot of records from those civilizations because of the clay tablets. And similarly, we have an awful lot of records of ancient Chinese civilization because of their work with clay and with ceramics. But the key really to uh, Chinese historical dominance in, in ceramics is kilns, is oven technology. I know this, now we're getting pretty nerdy, but and I admit it, but, but if you were studying, say, the Industrial Revolution, you wanted to look at what was going on, a really big issue there would be getting these ovens up to the temperatures that were needed for some of the things that were done in that period. And the Chinese guarded very jealously their, for centuries their technology as to how they made these oasts, these kilns, uh, get up to these temperatures in excess of 1,400, 1,500 degrees centigrade, which they did a long, long time before anybody else did it. Um, and so they really dominated. And this also, of course, Imperial China saw the uh, ceramic export as an opportunity to make money, but also as an opportunity to uh, express Chinese soft power culture. And so this was true as we saw in another video in the series with the Greeks, um, there was a, a big shops, there was government backing, uh, there were artists who were masters and they had apprentices and so on. So you can uh, study all of that. Um, uh, okay, so and as I and as I say there in the third bullet point, sometimes you'll see porcelain even called China Por porcelain is um, you heat up a certain kinds of ores that are related to crystals. They're glass-like, but they flow at high temperatures, and so you can use them for slip casting. Um, and these then then these things are decorated in, in these glazes and. Uh, well, uh, let's get on to looking at some of them. I want to start with the 
of course, at the beginning, Neolithic Chinese pottery, an ancient tradition. If you were a scholar of uh, Chinese ceramics, you would refer for each one of these periods, in this case, a Neolithic period and centuries of that, of that period, uh, you would refer to uh, anywhere between uh, three and four to half a do to a dozen or more different cultural groups that would all be part of that whole scene. There's just an awful lot of stuff always going on because China is an awfully large area like India. So you always have a lot of different stuff. Um, you have what we see everywhere when we look at Neolithic pottery. We have simple geometric designs and these geometrical designs gradually evolve into uh, more naturalistic expression until eventually you're getting uh, even the, the objects themselves are made into stylized shapes. You'll see when we look at the, the pottery in the next couple slides that uh, it reminds me anyway of pre-Columbian uh, Andes Mountain um, ceramics, Nazca and Chimor ceramics. As to that third bullet point on the slide we're looking at right now, these ceramics as always is the case around the world in anthropology and, and classical studies, ancient history are very important for tracing the movements of people, the expansion of some groups, uh, immigrations of other groups, movements of styles, because these are very well documented and the objects tell us a lot of information, just as again on the Greek scene, a great deal of the information that we have about, for example, Greek mythology is really actually comes from the ceramics. And that's also true of ancient Chinese studies. I think when we look at these Neolithic, very sort of early and simple uh, pottery for the next, we're gonna look at three or four of them right now. I think you'll, you'll see that fluid Chinese line. That's the last bullet point on the slide here that you think about a stylized Chinese lion, if you, you know, you can bring to mind that versus a sort of a, a lion like a European sculptor would do it, a more naturalistic one. And you have this kind of very fluid kind of cartoony line in uh, Chinese aesthetics that I think you can glimpse even this very early uh, in these very early pottery pieces. I mean, that's something we could see an Anasazi in the southwest uh, of North America. We could see a, a pre-Columbian Andes Mountain culture doing that. That could be an African piece. There's an interesting universality to the really ancient pottery. And yet at the same time, you can see the, in, the, in the fluidity of the line, if you're familiar with the Chinese, you know, tradition uh, of, of Chinese lines and draftsmanship, it's recognizably so. This one, uh, so much uh, like in form, and not coincidentally, there's a great deal of, of, um, of going back and forth between these cultures. Could be a Greek. Uh, uh, could be a Greek amphora. It's got, uh, you know, and um, but and similarly with the geometric designs. But when you look at the geometric designs on this object, you see again a certain kind of fluidity. Uh, I would say the movement of the chi energy. Although again, remember Lao Tzu and Confucius um, putting together the canonical Tao Te Ching actually somewhere around the fifth century uh, before the Common Era. Some of these objects are the second millennium, which is as much as a thousand years before that. Um, they had a tripod design for their ewers, for their water pitchers. And these often were made into, into stylized uh, animal shapes. Glazing and coloring uh, often also, of course, depends on the kind of materials that you have around. Um, the Etruscans had incredible uh, ore deposits of the alloys that they needed to make bronze, as they have incredible bronze tradition, but the geology has to be there. Well, similarly, with these more subtle things like the glazing and the coloring, um, not so easy to make a glaze that'll to make a color that'll stay fast and uh, depends on a lot of different factors. So Celadon is a green glaze developed during the Tang Dynasty, as you see there. And uh, this is an enormous sort of submarket. Celadon was off, made in modern times. You have Celadon objects that are mass produced, for example, in the United States in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, which are actually prized by collectors. But imagine how uh, prized these ancient um, objects over 
a thousand years old from uh, classical China fetch. Again, a celadon covering with a dragon wrapped around the mouth of the vessel there. And always, I mean, again, with uh, ancient Greek, um, I'm going to let it ring twice and say probably my swear. Yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, okay, never mind. I don't know what that, I don't know what that number is. Um, so anyway, um, right, funerary figures. And obviously in Egypt, even if we know only a little bit about Egyptology, we know that most of the information we get about Egyptology was because of their uh, rather extravagant funerary practices. Uh, similarly in Mesopotamia uh, and similarly in many other places, very important in China because the, um, as in Egypt, the idea was that the deceased uh, royalty would need all sorts of things in the afterlife. So we have uh, very nice pieces. Again, these are very old. These are from the earliest Song and Tang, another funerary object. And again, that's, that's about 1,300 to 1,500 years old. Beautiful, beautiful glazes. Uh, and that glaze that you're looking at, I mean, again, this object is from something like maybe the eighth century, the ninth century of the common era. So it's, you know, it's something like 1,200 years old. And look at the glaze that it has. You know, so these were really uh, incredible craftsmen. And these look like pieces that you can see. There's one on the left. So, I mean, you know, that, that looks like for a palette that a French impressionist might use. And it looks like a line that a French impressionist might use to do the flowers as well. To say nothing of the one on the right, which is a beautiful piece. I think I made one looks like, I, mean, I think I made some salt and pepper shakers that look like that in high school, but I think I made them by mistake because they screwed the glaze up. But this artist is not screwing the glaze up. And there are, as I mentioned, there are literally thousands of these objects. So eventually you've got uh, big workshops and you've got imperial investment. And, uh, and so then you really start to get this period of high art. You in Europe, I would say it uh, obviously Renaissance statuary in Italy and the big canvases of people like Rubens, which which couldn't have been made without uh, without big patronage. The equality of these ancient Chinese ceramics is is like that because they've got that kind of back. Just a beautiful thing. I give anything to be able to make an object like that. Beautiful and elegant lines, as I say, uh, that cephalon uh, color, cellophon color on the glaze on the right is one that then is very much used in later times, comes from China, and, and draftsmanship that is uh, really unbelievable and patterns that are unbelievable. Some of these uh, repeating patterns that we'll see on some of these objects are hand painted by stencils using stencils by artisans. Others are just hand painted uh, freehand by artisans. Uh, as I mentioned before, in, in Neolithic pottery, anthropologists look, that, look at that to look at sort of ethnic migrations, linguistic migrations uh, leading up to greater China. But now in the medieval period, we have these uh, marks and famous workshops. And so of course, that's tremendous um documentation and that documentation also enables us to understand a lot of things about the surrounding society not just about the ceramics so this blue on white is very characteristic we characterize it in europe we often find this called delft uh, the dutch were the first people to manage to reproduce what the chinese were doing it was hundreds of years later three or four hundred years it took them to figure that out but uh, it originally, the look originally is uh, Chinese. And so, uh, they're a nice big object. And you can learn, of course, also we learn a lot about everyday life in China. We learn about a lot about um, uh, the clothing people uh, wore and other things from these objects. And the Ming Dynasty uh, when you have that, this is all sort of uh, maturing into 
a uh, an exports an export industry that is at a very high peak of excellence indeed. And uh, those lines, I mean, someone someone hand painted that, and that's just enormously difficult to do. The treatment of one of the the vapors that they're standing on, or there's some kind of demigod, someone's playing a pan pipe. Uh, there is uh, someone in the middle who looks like there's sort of spirits coming out of his flask there. That might be Bodhidharma, I don't know. And again, just, uh, you see these repeating patterns as well. And as with uh, woven rugs from Asia, a lot of these repeating patterns are nonetheless uh, by hand, they are bespoke, and so the imperfections are also there because someone painted them in. Of course, that makes the object very, very precious. You see Islamic uh, Islamic characters. I don't know what they say, but these are being made in China in the 1500s for export out to the West over the Silk Road, which at that point is a thousand years old, a thousand five hundred years old. And they're using hand painted with stencils some of these patterns. And there are many, many of these patterns. And these are another way where you can identify where something comes from and who's making it. Then you have a change of dynasties. You have civil uh, disorder in the uh, 17th century, the Baroque period in Europe, by the way, and the Qing dynasty that comes into power around the middle of that century, the 17th century, goes all the way back to the Tang and Song to try to revive the classic tradition in a very self-conscious way. So we have these very nice, uh, again, very elegant objects. It's funny that a design that we would consider a very sort of modern, modernistic, minimalistic form follows function kind of design in a modern design context is very typical of in particular Chinese, and it's also true of Japanese uh, ancient design, classical design. I don't really have much to say about these two objects. I mean, these are two of the best ones that I saw just putting this together. 1800s, and I don't even know, I mean, <laughs> what, <laughs> how that's done. Uh, but of course, that's a very late piece. Modern Chinese artists continue the tradition. China is not a geopolitical problem. China is not a this or that. China is a very, very large country, very large civilization, very many artists uh, doing all kinds of things. And um, so there is the, this, the tradition that I've been introducing you today, introducing you to today is one that's been continuously present. We were just looking at some 19th century pieces at the end there. And uh, sure enough, that tradition is very much alive and well in China today. So this is, if we're interested in the arts, if we're interested in the humanities, uh, and, and of course, even let alone if we're interested in, in the history of ceramics as, as art historians, China's really it. I mean, you know, uh, and it's a, so rich and the objects are so, so beautiful. You really recommend it. Okay, I'll stop the chair. Okay, so a very brief introduction. What now, what I'm gonna do is make available to you on Moodle, the links, there are a lot of different ways you can go. Uh, there, you can look at different styles, you can look at different periods, you can look at the Neolithic stuff. You can look at the way these things are made. That's something that always interests me. And I'll give you some links as to how these things are done, how these artists got those designs onto those surfaces um, and other things. Um, we didn't talk about lacquerware. Well, I'll give you a link to lacquerware and you can look at that too. So. Uh, all right, so that's classical Chinese ceramics on a stick. Uh, it's a beautiful topic, so enjoy yourself this week uh, looking up uh, and studying more about uh, classical Chinese ceramics and classical Chinese porcelain. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording.